Hi, this is Bobby Kimbrough, and once again, welcome to Off the Cuffs with Sheriff Kimbrough. Um, as always, I'm excited to be here, always excited to have conversation, but I'm extremely excited today. I got a good friend of mine, traveling man with me, retired at that, recently retired, Lieutenant Rowley. I want to welcome you to the show Off the Cuffs, and welcome back home to the uh, Sheriff's Office. Thank you, sir. So how's retirement been? What, a month now? Uh, it's close to two months now. Two months, yeah. Yes, wow. You enjoying it? I am, more so than I thought I would. Yes, sir. Wow. How long were you here? I uh, worked for the sheriff's office for 26 years. Wow, wow. So, you know, we've been talking about, uh, for the last couple of uh, podcasts, we've been talking about surviving the shield, surviving the job, surviving the profession. We talked about... Uh, we had Captain Bowman in here, and he was sharing some things that were very insightful to uh, the viewers about some of the things that he endured over working with the uh, in law enforcement. We had the chaplain in here uh, last week, uh, and he talked about some of the issues or some of the pressures of first responders. And so, you know, we did the uh, the series uh, Valor on Vance Road which involved you, and we encourage our, our viewers to go and watch that on our uh, Facebook page. But in keeping in line with what we've been talking about, I want to really segue into some things, and but I won't just jump right into them. So for those of us that don't, for those of them that don't know you and know, uh, tell us about yourself. Just you know, tell us where you began this career before you retired. Um. Well, I started uh, United States Military Police. Wow. So right a month after I graduated high school, I went into the Army. Thank you. And um, thank you. Um, spent uh, my first enlistment in the U.S. Army. I was in South Korea for about a year and a half, and then I got uh, transferred to Fort Stewart, Georgia, and uh, finished out my tour there. Um, met my first wife in the army and uh we were both mps and she was from clemens so um we got married it was either go to nebraska or move to clemens so we ended up moving to clemens um went through blet and uh started in 92 we took night classes so every night for six months we're in blet graduated in the spring of 93 and um was immediately hired on as a special deputy with uh, Forsyth Tech uh, okay. Campus Police. Uh, worked there for about six months and then got hired on with animal control uh, as a special deputy. And I was there for six years and then transferred over to the sheriff's office. Um, and I worked in uh, court security, transportation, civil... Um, fleet and procurement, uh, patrol, and uh, ended my career in training. Wow. So <clears throat> I have to set the stage for this. So when I first came into the office in December, uh, I remember the incident on Vance Road. I remember hearing about it, reading about it, people talking about it. And so when I came into the office in December, I was talking to a few people in the office and they kept saying your first name, Jeremy. And I was like, who is he? And so I never put the two to two together until the day you or I were in the conference room and we started talking and it hit me that you were the same guy, the hero, that saved lives out on Vance Road that day. And I say this, you know, you meet people in life who who have an effect on you when you meet them. Uh, I knew something was special about you, not just because uh, we were large brothers uh, in the same organization, but I knew something special about you. And so... I think I told you this after the fact, I started asking a lot of questions about you 
going around asking people that knew you, I asked uh, Rocky and a few other people, who is this guy? Tell me about him. Very, I can honestly say that very few things that I, very few men in life have made me feel like, wow. And the things that they told me about your life was very humbling. And it's a true testament to who you are, the humble giant you are, the spirit that you possess. And the more they told me about the things in your life that had happened, the more I realized that we see an individual, but we never know their story. We never know how they got here. We never know the valleys and the rivers and the mountains that they've climbed and come through and survived them. And so I told um, Rocky, I said, listen, I want to document, I want to record this story. I want him to tell his story because very few people know what takes place to carry a gun and a badge. Very few people know the kind of man or woman that it takes to carry a gun and a badge. The kind of man and a woman that is almost like Clark Kent. When danger is there, they swing into action and become Superman. Excuse me, and sometimes Superwoman. Very few people know the man and the women that the men and the women that serve, whether it's in federal, state, local law enforcement, that when there's an issue and people are running from the fire, those are the men and women running to it. And that's what happened that day on Vance Road when things went terribly wrong and people lost their life. You didn't think twice and you swung into action and you paid a price. And so I, I almost feel... I don't want you to relive it. I don't. But I felt like that some stories must be told because by telling some parts of it, it could save someone's lives or, or help someone's life. And so I wanted you to come here today because I know that you're retired, you're enjoying life, you just got your CDL license, you told me. Um, going to be driving a real big truck, 18 wheelers out here just traveling around the country, right? But how did you get here? I mean, when you look back over your life, did you think you would make it to retirement? Did you think that the day before Vance rolled, did you think you'd be in the hospital the next day? Did you think that your life would change and spin on a dime? And then the question I got for you, too, is if you had to do it all over again, would you have waited before you went down there? Would you have chosen another profession? Because a lot of people don't know the heart of a giant, the heart of a hero. So tell me. Um. Well, uh, um, I don't know what to say. Um, I've never really been comfortable with people calling me a hero or, or what you, it's, it's a fact, I know though. it sounds, well, and, and thank you. I, I, I do appreciate that. It just, it sounds cliche-ish, I, I'm sure, but. It really is like that's your job. That's what you sign up to do. I mean, if you weren't working that day, um, I wasn't, at, and that's kind of leads into a funny story. Um, I was supposed to be on duty that night. I was assigned to the transportation unit, and that night, if I had been on duty, I would have been in Butner, North Carolina, because the person that took my spot that night had to take a trip to Butner, North Carolina transporting a patient so i would have been you know two hours away from this when it all all happened um 
as it was, our agency was hosting a first-line supervision class that week at the detention center. And I had the opportunity to attend it. So I was in class all week um, on day shift. So so were you a sergeant then? Uh, corporal. You were a corporal, okay. Yes, sir. Um, myself and uh, Ashley Gaylor was in that class. Um, and then several people from other agencies were attending that class as well. And um, so... You know, certain things you remember, like 9-11, everyone remembers where they were on 9-11. Um, November 11th, 2004, I remember being in class, and I remember for some reason it sticks out, but we were debating on where we were going to eat lunch, and uh, Ashley wanted to go to some little Chinese restaurant in a strip mall off of Peters Creek Parkway, and I did not want to eat at a Chinese restaurant in a strip mall, but we went there and it was good. And um, I was, I picked her, I was giving her a ride all week that week and uh, took her home and dropped her off. And then I went home and um, Lori was a night shift nurse. She had to go in that night. So I spent maybe an hour with her that night. And um, yeah, I was in the basement doing laundry when I first found out everything was happening. So. And so when you found out things were happening, shots fired, people had been killed, and you jumped in your vehicle, were you less than a mile from this place? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's, it's just down the road. Okay, so you, a block or two, a city block or two. Probably. From where well, the actual shooting is taking place. Mm -hmm. So you probably could hear the shots being fired before you got there. Um. I was in the back. I really hadn't heard any shots fired yet. It was, and at the time, I did not know anyone had been hit. Um, my wife was on the phone with her mother, who had um, told her that the suspect was at their pro at their farm with a gun. So that's when I just jumped into action. Um, Grab my grab my ballistic vest and my handgun and my duty radio and went down there just to see what was going on and uh, drove into a, a firefight basically. How many people lost their lives that day? Three, three people. How many times were you hit? Um, three, three that I know of. I was hit. I was hit in the arm, and I was hit in my neck, and I was hit in my chest. So what kind of round was he was he firing? It was a seven point six two. It was a SKS assault rifle. You know, when you started talking, you said that you were supposed to be in Butner. You were supposed to have been working that evening, and I'm always of the mindset that. God doesn't give you any more than you can handle. And sometimes there are no coincidences. That's just where you're supposed to be for that reason because had you not been there, more lives would have been lost. Had you not been there, it would have been a different chain of events. And so the fact that you were there and what you did um, in a gunfight with the SK and a handgun, and then later a shotgun, was remarkable. I won't go into details because I want people to go to the Facebook and look at it, listen to it. But what I will tell you is that, because I want to move into something else, what I will tell you is that I have listened to the 911 tape. I have read the reports I have spoken with people that responded there to assist you, uh, spoken with your wife, your family. I've seen the pictures and you probably under normal circumstances, we should be mourning your loss now, but you survived that for a reason. And then 
as I studied your life, I, because when I hear people that have went through extraordinary situations in life and hardships and still find the courage to get up every day and look life square in the face and say, here I am for another round. That's amazing to me because I know you've had tragedy before with losing two kids. Yes, sir. Two kids in a boating accident. Mm -hmm. But yet every day you still showed up for the fight. You still showed up for work. And I've always seen you with a pleasant face, a heck of an attitude. I mean, wish we could bottle it up and market it and place it in people's spirit. But my question is this, when you look back over your life and all that you've been through, do you feel like you would have done some things differently, chose a different profession? How, how, how do you, you know, I hear people say all the time that you get over things. I, I don't know how that happens. I, I never got over losing my, my wife. I never got over it. I've learned to live with it, right? So I, how do you get over a firefight like that? How do you get over losing two of your kids and still maintain the right frame of mind with the attitude, I'm going to get it again today? And when before we started, we were talking off camera and you was talking and you you're so excited about having your CDL license. You're ready to start driving around the country. Uh, what do you, what do you what drives you? What do you get the energy to become? There are many women in this job that have faced some hardships and don't know how to get up the next day and make it work. There are some that are gonna face some hardships and gonna need to know how to get up. So tell me what drives you? What what do you look forward to? What what kept you going through those difficult times? Um, it's a good question. Uh, first would would be my faith. Um, you know, I I believe in the Lord. I believe in Jesus and heaven, and um, I'm not like I can't quote a Bible verse. I'm not. I don't have that kind of background or faith, but I know what I believe in. Um, and um, my wife, it's, you know, if she's been through everything I've been through with me step step for step, everything, and she does have that background, being raised in church, and she can find you know, verses that I need, and um, she's, I mean, she's my rock. I mean, can't really say anything other than that. I mean, she's, she's it. Well, that's true. Then every great, behind every great man, there's a, excuse me, behind, beside every great man, there's a great woman because God. what you said is basically she has gotten you through she has been there step for step. She has carried you. Uh, she was sharing with me when you were in a hospital. <clears throat> um, and she is a nurse, correct? Yes. She, she's an RN. Yeah. Yeah. She was sharing with me when they were going to perform surgery on you that night uh, after you had been shot several times. And she talked about how, if I'm not mistaken, her father mm -hmm. introduced you all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure did. She told me that. I remember that. And it's so amazing to me that what you've been through and your faith holds you together. It's amazing to me what you've been through and you're able to still talk about it. It's amazing to me that you were still able to function every day after that situation when you came back to work. Most people would have went on out on a permanent disability. Uh, but you came back and made uh, con uh, 
contributions to this agency. You came back and you mentored people. You came back and you shared your story with me and allowed us to create valor on Vance. But what I want to do now is, is I want you to just think for a moment about the job of law enforcement. And I want you to tell us, tell the people that are watching and that are listening, what does it take to survive this? What does it take to survive the the shield, the star? What does it take to survive this job? Because you've had some hardships. You've had some difficult times. Uh, you said um, this is your second wife, you said, right? Yes. Right. And so it's a very difficult profession to not only work in, but actually raise a family and be a, a spouse and more importantly, maintain your sanity. More importantly, maintain who you are and what you are. And you truly are a testament to you have done that and then some. Uh, you have a daughter that works in law enforcement, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, surprised I remember all those things, right? <laughs> You're doing good. Uh, yeah, that's because you truly have marked my life. You know, um, you meet people in your life and you listen to their stories and they tell you things and you see them. Most people don't walk it like they talk it. They talk it, but they don't walk it. But when you meet people that walk it, talk it, talk it, and walk it all together, they catch your eye. And I've watched you. I've heard you. Uh, I've read your story uh, in terms of the reports. I've spoken with your family. I saw the look in their eyes at your retirement. I saw how uh, your wife looked at you, your kids looked at you, your family. And that means a lot because you have truly left an indelible footprint, not only at this place, the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office, but in life in general. You have been that ripple in a pond that hit in the middle and spread out and affected a lot of things. I remember joking with you about uh, the SROs, and I was trying to tell you, do you like this outfit that we were trying to put together? And... Uh, I think someone was telling me, or you was telling me, you went and asked your, your daughter about this thing. We were talking about swagger, uh, khakis and a blazer, and uh, tennis shoes, and you just didn't see that as uh, anything with a little swag to it. And I remember making a comment saying, you must be from Nebraska, I said. Nebraska. I said, you must be from Nebraska or something. Just joking with you. And uh, I realized that when I said that a couple of days later, and I said to myself, wherever he's from, they grew him right there because that man has truly been a man amongst boys, not only in his spirit, but in responding to Vance Rowe. I thank you for what you did that day. Even though I was not the sheriff, then I thank you on behalf of the county because what you did that day was that was heroic, without questions. Whether you accept it or not, it was heroic by all accounts. Everyone that was a part of it, that read the reports, that saw um, the reenactment of it, everyone said that was heroic. But before we close up, because I don't want to keep you away, I know you're on uh, retirement time now, you retire, but tell us something that a young officer could put in his toolbox and carry it with him. A grown man could put in his toolbox and live by. Because you have given me something that you said step by step, your wife has been there with you. You have made her a part of everything you went through. Even though she didn't take one round, she carried the pain that her husband took. And so, I guess that's the hope that keeps us going every day. I guess that's the drive uh, 
And I guess that's what we live for, this thing called love. And when you find it like that, it'll take you through some difficult times. Uh, what I've learned in my life is that when you go through difficult times, you got to have something that will carry you. You got to have something that is greater than you, and that's love and your religion. So I won't take up any more of your time. I want to give you time to give me answers to those questions as to what do you give a young officer uh, to put in his toolbox, and what would you share with our listeners and our viewers? Uh, because there are a lot of people out there that need the knowledge. You are battle tested in a lot of areas. Um, well, for the for the younger officers, you know, first and foremost, you can have every piece of equipment under the sun, but you have to have the the mental toughness to um, stay in the fight and and survive there's um that was something our firearms instructor at the time before this um was on us all the time we we had to travel to qualify we had to qualify we would borrow ranges mount aries outdoor range lexington police department's range um i remember us going to uh a Department of Corrections range in Lexington, and when you're borrowing someone's range, it's not in the spring and then in the fall. It's in the dead of winter or right in the middle of summer. And I remember one particular year we were qualifying, and it was in November or December, and it mm-hmm. was snowing. And um, this firearms instructor, you know, we were not happy. We did not want to be out there. And he was like, "You, you train." You know, no one's going to not get involved in a situation because it's snowing. That's when something's, you know, going to happen. So, um, I mean, we were cold and wet and miserable, but we still did what we needed to do, and we trained and qualified with our, you know, handguns. And um, he always had that mentality. No matter what happens, stay in the fight. You're not out of the fight until you're out of the fight. And that always stuck with me. And um, that's probably the main thing that kept me alive on November 11th was um, I got hit instantaneously. As soon what as, was the first round hit you at? Uh, the left arm um, that I know of. I didn't realize I was hit in the neck or the chest until I was in the ambulance. Um, had no idea. But as soon as I got hit in the left arm, I lost all use of it. It just dropped straight to my side and um, couldn't move it at all. And, um, but I, my mental fortitude was, okay, you're hit, your left arm's out, now what do you do? And I would work through checklists in my mind and, um, I was like, okay, the car door is not good cover. I need to move to better cover. So I would move around to the back of the car over to the other side to have more cover. And then um, I ran out of ammunition in my handgun. And in my haste leaving the house, I didn't grab any extra magazines. So you have that quick second of, okay, this is not good. But then going through your mental checklist – you know, I hit, okay, I have a shotgun in my trunk, um, but my left arm's disabled, so you have to run through that checklist. So we, you know, as it's in the documentary, I managed to get the shotgun out of the trunk. How did and, you open the trunk? Um, we had uh, push buttons on the driver's side door, so I had to go back around to the driver's side door and push the trunk release button. Um And then the trunk popped open and just using my right arm, I had to, you know, remove the shotgun, uh, rack around into the chamber and had to do all that with just my right hand. Um, But it's just going through that mental, you know, we don't train on that in the range. We certainly didn't before that time. Um, But it's just going through that mental checklist. And um, that's 
you know, I had the mindset, I am not, I'm not dying tonight. I mean, that was, and I do remember that going through my mind. This is, this is not going to be my last, you know, thing I do. So, um, mindset, mindset, mind, mindset is everything. It's everything. I mean, it's, you know, like I said, you can have it in this agency has always had, you know, the best equipment, the newest equipment, the most equipment. Um, we've always been known for that. But, and you can have the best and the most of everything. But if your mindset is not that you're going to win this, then that none of that stuff's going to help you. Um, wow. the, the next most important thing I would say is wear your ballistic vest. Most, if not all, of our junior officers now wear their vest, especially with the outer carriers that we have mm -hmm. now. It's a lot easier to, to wear your vest. Um, back in the day, and you know, you know, when vests first came out, they were 40 pounds yeah. and under your shirt and just, just unbearable hot in the summer. Um, but I was one that always wore my vest. If I was in uniform, I had my vest on. And just out of habit, you know, even just, it's just, you don't even think. So that night when I'm getting my stuff put together, you know, it's something I throw on over my civilian clothes is my ballistic vest. And that definitely, you know, saved my life when I took around to the chest. Um, that vest didn't stop the round because it was a rifle round, um, but definitely slowed it down enough to where it didn't penetrate and I didn't have a through and through. Um, it penetrated my chest somewhat and I had a bruised heart and a collapsed lung and some shrapnel as a result of all that. But if I didn't have the vest, then I probably would have dropped, you know, right there and that'd have been it. So, um, and, and just practice, 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 you know. So let me ask you this. So the difficult times that you've been in in your life and the tragedies, it was the mindset that got you through and the wife and your faith. Yes. Those are three common denominators. Mindset, your faith, and the wife. Yeah. Yes. I like that. Um, you know, I, I, I look back over my personal life, my own career, and I think – the common denominator is mindset. And so I want to thank you for having the mindset that you've had um, since taking up this law enforcement. I want to thank you for being a part of the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office for all the years that you were because what I've been saying is that we have inherited something that was built before we got here, and all we're doing is building upon that which we got. And you were definitely a part of that, building that legacy, that footprint, that indelible footprint, because it's men like you that have made this place great. It's men that were not so as fortunate as you that lost their lives. It's men that have retired from here who never fired a shot but it's all of us that have made this agency great. And I want to thank you for your service as well as in the armed service. I want to thank you for your service with the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office. I want to thank you for uh, imparting in my life uh, since I've known you. I've learned a lot from you along the way. And I want you to make sure you tell your wife Thank you for letting us borrow you today for a couple of hours, for an hour. And um, we're definitely going to see you again. And feel free to stop by anytime because it's stories like this that give us understanding of what this job really is and could be. It's men like you that give us the world a view of the ordinary men like Clark Kent. But when the situation calls, they become supermen and women. And for that, I say thank you. 
And as always, we want to welcome you. No, we want to thank you and welcome you to always join us at Off the Cuffs. Thank you.